Welcome to the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teaching you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. share with you tonight on the subject of um, how God taught Abraham the law of the new covenant. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them to the third chapter of Romans. <clears throat> We're going to begin with verse 10 because we have, uh, I hear people once in a while or have heard of people that say, well, you know what the Bible says, there's none righteous, no, not one. Well, no, the Bible doesn't say that. That is a statement in the Bible under the Old Covenant. But let's read verse 10. Paul's quoting the Old Testament Scripture, Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, I have, uh, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There are none that doeth good. No, not one. Well, now, I'll skip down to verse 19. You know, the Bible explains itself if you just read long enough. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and you sh uh, the truth shall make you free. Verse 19 says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now he tells you what the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law. How many of you know we're not under the law of the old covenant? Now he goes on to say, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for they all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Somebody asked Brother Copeland one time, said, said what's your background? He said, sinner. <laughs> that's, that's what our, all our background, we all came out of the same boat. He goes on to say, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time His righteousness. Now, when in two verses of Scripture it makes the same statement and they're next to each other, it's very important. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. But what law? Of works? Nay, or no, but by the law of faith. Now he goes on to say, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So what Paul is saying, there are some righteous in the earth today. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and it comes through faith. It doesn't come through the works of the law. It becomes by what we believe in the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from, from our sins and, and uh, redeem us. So he goes on to say, is he the God of the Jew only? He is, he is not, is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Justified the circumcision through faith under the old covenant, but the uncircumcision well, let me read it again. Seeing it is one God which justified the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith, through the faith that we recognize we don't have to be circumcised like under the law. So he goes on to say, do we then make void the law through faith? He says, God forbid. 
we establish the law. Now, let's, let's look at that statement for a minute. He says, we establish the law. Now, you recognize the fact that he's just talking about that under the old law there was none righteous. If there could have been righteousness, a law given that would make men righteousness, then Paul says in another place, righteousness would have been to the law. But what he's saying here is we establish the law not the law of the old covenant, it's the law of the new covenant, and the law of the new covenant is faith. It's the law of the new covenant. Now, Paul talks about this in Romans the 8th chapter, and he says that the carnal mind is enmity against God and not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be. Now, what do you mean you're not subject to the law of God? The carnal mind. You can't operate faith in your head. You know, faith works in the heart. Paul said, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Now, faith works in the heart. The reason it won't work in the head, there's no substance up here. <laughs> the substance is in the heart. Faith is in the heart, not in the head. Uh, you know, head faith is mental assent. Well, yes, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. You hear people say that sometimes, but you, you quote them a few scriptures. Oh, yeah, but now here's what I believe about that. Uh-huh. No, they, they, they mental assent that the Bible is true, but there's multitudes of scriptures in there that they don't believe. Doesn't believe belong to them anyway. So uh, Paul said, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. He said we establish a law, but he's talking about establishing the law of the new covenant, which is the law of faith, because right in chapter 4 he goes on to say, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now we're going to read uh, uh, the biggest part of this, this fourth chapter because if, if we get this part of it, it'll help us understand some things we're going to say a little, little further on. So just stay with me. We're laying a foundation. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed the man of whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. When you read this in the Old Testament, you'll find out that circumcision was only a sign of the faith that he already had. For he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. Now, that's an awesome statement. He is the Father of all them that believe. He's called the Father of our faith in another place. And He's the Father of all that believe. In other words, God taught Abraham the law of faith and we're going to talk about how he taught him the law of faith. Because when God teaches you faith, he teaches you faith. We may talk about one night how Jesus teaches faith, how he taught faith. Now he goes on to say in verse 12, And the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised, for the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
Now, you, you just can't get it any plainer than that. I mean, if words mean anything, <laughs> that tells us the, the whole thing in a nutshell right there. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed. Now, when it says his seed, that includes us, because Christ was the seed. But when he says seeds, he's talking about uh, those that believe, and uh, we're, we're involved in that. Christ was the seed, but if we be Christ, then we're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now come down to verse uh, 16. Therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace. To the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, these, these are awesome statements concerning our father Abraham. The statement in verse 16, therefore it is of faith. Now, I like what Brother Hagin says. He said, when you find the word therefore, find out what it's there for. <laughs> it connects these two verses, you see. Uh, and, and it says, uh, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. The only way. Now, if you don't get anything else out of tonight, if you get this, it'll help you. The only way you have access to the grace of God is through faith. You can't get there any other way. You can't get there by doing good works. Now, you ought to do good works, all right, but it's through faith. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is the law, but that also which is the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God is the one that taught Abraham faith. And uh, he struggled. Abram struggled with faith. You'll notice it says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But Abram never did believe God the way Abraham believed God. Abram, Abram struggled with it. Now, he goes on talking about Abraham here. He said in verse 18, who against hope, in other words, Abraham against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Now, how can you believe in hope when there's not any? When there was no hope, no natural hope. I mean, the man is past the, the, the age, uh, and, his, and his wife is barren. He was 75 years old when God told him to come out from among his kin, and, and he would lead him to a, a place uh, that would be the promised land. And uh, you know that the story there, he took Lot with him and his nephew, and then they got to having strife among the herdsmen because they had so many cattle, or they separated from one another. Now, you can read this in the 12th chapter of, uh, of Genesis where he, he told Abram, he said, uh, I, have, uh, I will make great nations out of you. Now, here's a man that is, is uh, 75 years old at that time. And uh, I think we better turn to that. Hold your place there, and we, we, we'll turn to it, because it's a, two or three places here that I want you to mark if you don't have it marked in your Bible. <clears throat> it's important for us to understand how God dealt with Abraham. In... Uh, Chapter 12 of, of Genesis, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kin, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I'll make thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make, make uh, thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, that's quite a, a statement to a man that's 75 years old, and, and he's going to bless all the people, the families of the earth. 
Well, we know that he, uh, he left. Now, if you, if you come over to the uh, 13th chapter, verse 14 tells us, And the Lord said to Abram, after that Lot had separated from him, now, you know, there's something about that when he said, come out from among your kin. You know, sometimes if you've got unbelieving kin folks, <laughs> you may have to get away from them if you're going to believe God. You, you know, some folks have just been, uh, you, you think they've been uh, uh, baptized in unbelief, you know, and uh, they just will not get off of doubt, fear, and unbelief. So, if you're going to believe God, sometimes you have to get away from those folks for a while. The Lord said to Abram, after that Lot had separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, uh, eastward, and westward, and all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it in thy seed forever. Now, this is a physical land, is the Canaan land, and, and uh, God said, I'm going to give you everything you can see. Now, I want you to notice this statement. Look east, west, north, south. I'm going to give you everything you can see. If you can see it, you can have it. Now, that was a physical land. Today, our promised land uh, are the promises of the new covenant. If you can see it, conceive it in your heart, see it by faith, you can have it. Now, quite often you'll hear people make statements like, well, you know, I just can't see this healing business. Well, now, why can't they see it? They don't have enough information. See, somebody said, well, they don't have any faith. Well, now, that's a symptom. That's not the problem. The problem is not enough word. Faith is resonant in the Word of God. God's Word is filled with faith. A person could have great faith in salvation, and, and many people do. There are certain denominations. I mean, they get folks saved just going and coming. But because they don't have the Word of God in their heart concerning healing or baptism of the Holy Spirit or something other pertinent doctrine of the Bible, they don't believe it. So they have great faith in in salvation, they can take you down the Roman road, a uh, person down the Roman road, and get them saved in a minute, <clears throat> but turn around and tell them, but God won't heal you because that went out with the apostles. <clears throat> now, why, why do they believe that? Because they've been taught it. Faith cometh by hearing. See, faith comes by hearing. And, and one of the problems is that, that people have not understood that faith comes more quickly when they, you hear yourself saying things. So when you talk your problems, when you talk your fears, when you talk your doubt and unbelief, it produces more doubt and unbelief because it's faith in what you said. Faith in fear produces fear. The more you talk about it, the more you believe it, the more you hear it, the more you believe it. That's the way it comes. Faith or fear comes by hearing. Whether you're hearing God or whether you're hearing the devil, faith is coming. Faith in the devil is called fear. It's the reverse gear of faith, really. You know, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Well, what is it we hope for? Well, I hope for what God has given me, don't you? 2 Corinthians 1, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Isn't that good news? God's already said yes to it. We're supposed to be saying, so be it. That's what amen means, so be it. But you know, I'll hear, I hear people once in a while, they'll say, well, yeah, now, Brother Caps, I know that's in the Bible, but now, now here's, here's, here's what happened to me. Well, you know what they did? They cast out the Word in favor of the experience they had. Now, the Word still says the same thing. What they experienced didn't change the Word of God, but it changed what they believed. Now, Jesus put it this way. In uh, John chapter 15, verse 7, He said, uh, If ye abide in Me, and My words 
abide in you. Notice, abide in you. Ask what you will, and it shall be done. Now we can take other scriptures and add to that and say, say what you will, pray what you will, decree what you will, and it shall be done. And it's all valid, scripturally valid things that Jesus said. I tell you, if you get in trouble, read the red in, the, in this red letter edition. <laughs> It'll straighten out some of your, your, your wrong ideas. All things, Jesus said, all things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. Now people will argue with you. Well, now I know I believe, but I didn't receive. Jesus talking about Bible faith. You see, you know you could believe with all your heart and not have an ounce of Bible faith. Getting quiet in here. <laughs> you could believe that what happened to brother so-and-so, if God did it for him, he'll do it for me. You could have great faith in that. Don't have an ounce of Bible faith. That's not Bible faith. That's faith in what happened to brother so-and-so has nothing to do with the Word of God. Now, people say, well, yeah, but you know, the Bible says that God's no respecter of person. That's right. God's no respecter of person. But do you know what brother so-and-so know? No, knew? <clears throat> did you do what he did? Did you give like he gave? Did you confess the things he confessed for six, eight months until faith came? And it was abundantly in the heart. Then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So you see, sometimes people just scratch the surface and don't realize that there's more to it than just, you know, some, sometimes in the 70s when the Word of Faith was taught, the early 70s, like never before in this nation, people got the idea that uh, sometimes they, they'd go to a seminar and, and come home and think there's a three-day wonder. And, uh, and they said, well, all you got to do is say it. Oh, no, there's a lot more to it than saying it. You must believe. You must doubt not in your heart. You must believe what you're saying will come to pass, not just what you said to the mountain. Remember, Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to the mountain, talking about a mountain of adversity, whatever's a mountain in your life, might be a financial mountain, whosoever shall say to it, Be removed. Well, the fact that you said be removed proves it, hadn't, it wasn't removed at that point, right? Doubt not in your heart. Now, the Greek says, be not undecided in your heart. Don't be undecided in your heart. Now, James picks up on something that you, a little bit of information needs to go with that. James said that uh, a double, uh, if any lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all liberally, upbraideth not, it shall be given him. But, <laughs> not through talking, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven of the wind, and tossed upon the shore. Let not that man, now listen, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. That means nothing. <laughs> now, I didn't say it. James, the brother of Jesus, said it. He caught what Jesus said. You abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask what you will, decree what you will, pray what you will, and it shall be done. All things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. So we're only limited, according to Jesus, we're only limited by what we can believe based on the authority of the Word of God. That's the only limitation. If you can believe it, you can have it. Thank you so much for joining us for the Concepts of Faith broadcast today. Now, before I leave the broadcast, I want to offer a special offer today. This is one of my favorite series. It's called Faith, the Law of the New Covenant. You know, the Apostle Paul in Romans, the fourth chapter, made this statement. 
He said, where is boasting? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. In other words, uh, he was talking about righteousness which comes by faith. And he's calling faith the law. Faith is a law. And if you don't understand that, you get confused when you read the old, old covenant because it was a law of works. If you did certain things, then you were considered all right. Now, you know, your sins were not forgiven. They just swept under the rug, so to speak. They were covered by sacrifices. But under the new covenant, it's the law of faith. We believe that the blood of Jesus does away with sin. It does not just cover it. It removes the handwriting from the note, the Scripture says. I mean, I get excited when I talk about it. Then Paul goes on down and says in verse 31, Do we then make void the law through faith? He says, God forbid. We establish the law. Now, it's very evident that he's not talking about establishing the law of the old covenant. He's talking about establishing the law of the new covenant. So this is law of the new covenant. It's uh, three audio cassettes and an album for $18 plus $4 postage and handling. Uh, we have a toll-free order line. It's 1-877-396-9400. That's 1-877-396-9400. It's tape offer number 2316. That's number 2316, law, the faith, the law of the new covenant. Now, Paul is talking about the righteousness which comes by faith. Now, if you remember, Paul in Romans, the eighth chapter, talked about the law of God. He said the carnal mind is enmity against the law of God, and uh, it, you can't receive or you can't believe things with your carnal mind. You can believe with your heart. See, faith works in the heart. He said the carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God. He's talking about the law of faith, the law of the new covenant. This series will help you in understanding how to operate in faith under the new covenant and believe in the blood of Jesus. Until next time, this is Charles Capps reminding you that the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready? Ready or not, Jesus is coming soon. To order a copy of today's show or any product offered on this program, call 1-877-396-9400 or visit our website at caps.tv where you can order downloads of our MP3 teachings, eBooks, and watch other programs on demand. This broadcast has been sponsored by Caps Ministries and is dedicated to helping you put the Word of God to work in the everyday circumstances of your life.